Uh, our three speakers uh, have uh, generously agreed to uh, answer questions, uh, take comments uh, co uh, from uh, those present here. Uh, there certainly is a number of uh, certainly are a number of challenges that they have uh, set forward to uh, <coughs> conventional uh, orthodox uh, thinking. Uh, so what I propose uh, is that uh, we'll throw the floor open for uh, short questions or very brief comments. Uh, in order to allow as many people to, to speak as possible, uh, I would ask that you be brief in your question or comment and that you direct your comment or question to uh, one of the speakers and then we can have perhaps a little bit more uh, room for others to uh, speak up as well. So, uh, volunteers, uh, first question from the, from the floor. I have uh, piles of questions myself that I would prefer <laughs> to, uh, to throw it open to the floor. Yes, please. Um, if I could ask, thank you very much for your, your presentations. I, I was hoping that um, you had the quotation from St. Maximus that I, I put down on my hand to every person who partakes of virtue. Yeah. Would you have the reference for that? Um, I do. I have to see what I put it in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think it's in, I, I think I said it was the ambiguous, but I don't know. Which, I, didn't, I did not put in my paper which one. So if you email me, um, my email is easy to find it at you know, Fordham University, and I'm the only technical out there. Thank um, you. <laughs> I, will, uh, I, will send, I'll, I will send you the exact uh, reference, but it's from the Ambigua. Thank you. Yeah. Dan, please. So picking up on this, this theme of personhood and the, the synergies with uh, thought of the NRS and so forth, I really liked your paper, uh, Dr. Hoffman Glow, uh, about uh, framing how the Orthodox Church needs to be engaged in modern conversations about ethics and politics. But I noticed in Norris and some other thinkers that the actual content of what the church is expected to teach within that conversation, frame as you frame it, uh, is, is often, if not always, in fact, really quite traditional. The charisma sort of remains. It's the same path, it's the same sorts of things that the church is expecting people to do. I, I was uh, one, you seemed at the very end of your paper to kind of challenge that a little bit. Uh, and I was wondering if you could comment on that a little, whether that traditionalism is essential to uh, doing the conversation the way you want to do it, yeah. uh, whether it's negotiable, whether there's yeah. pushback this way or that way. Uh, I just wondered if you could comment on that issue. Yeah, that touches on all three of our papers. Maybe we can yeah, I think it does. Yeah. Quickly, but, um, first of all, I'm very pro-tradition. I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't think that a human, there's no such thing as de-institutionalized or de-tradition existence, period. Um, so there is a bit of a, um, there is a bit of a, a, I think a misconception, misunderstanding, which is also being brought out in political philosophy by people like Jeffrey Stout, that somehow living in America is, America is just kind of this um, structured space where everybody uh, can live according to their own traditions, but it's not a tradition itself, but that's wrong. I mean, democracy is a tradition. Um, so there's no, there's, so we have to be careful what we mean, what we mean by more traditional. Right, um, and at Fordham University, this is a bit of a plug. We're having a conference in June on tradition, uh, secularization, and fundamentalism, and those words are on purpose because are they really opposed to each other? Does tradition necessarily mean fundamentalism? And so, what does it really mean to live according to the tradition? And I think that all three of us, in many ways, are kind of saying that to live according to the tradition isn't not necessarily quite the way that certain people are kind of making it out to be, right? And um, and I just think in terms of, just very quickly, my own paper, I think with someone like Anadas, I mean, there, is, there are these diametrically opposed bordered spheres for him. And I, I just don't think it works that way, right? I mean, I think that um, in, in orthodoxy, we have a tendency to um, elide the church with culture and politics and things like that, and I think that's very dangerous. I think the political space is by definition the non-church space. And in that sense, we have to confront people who don't believe what we believe. So at that point, we have to really figure out, you know, what, what do we want institutionalized within that space? Uh, and I use this as an extreme example, but we're not gonna push for fasting laws. Um, and so, you know, you know, so we, we just have to kind of realize that, and we have to kind of uh, think more clearly and discerningly about that uh, in some sense. And uh, 
it might be that within that political space, we might have to affirm not simply a pluralism of beliefs that we don't agree with, but a certain kinds of institutionalization of uh, moral perspectives that we don't necessarily agree with either. Um, it just simply is that the case. But I don't see that as contract. I don't see allowing that to happen as sort of against the church. So we still teach fasting. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, and we and we persuade and so on and so forth. But those who are going to be converted to thinking that fasting leads towards uh, uh, theosis with God are then ultimately kind of moving sort of within sort of the ecclesial sphere. In yeah. Some sense. yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Perry, you're a panelist. Would you like to pick that up? Uh, Perry, do you... uh, no, no. Maybe, maybe later, not now. We spoke, uh, I think, uh, most times. So, uh, if you need this, please. Perry? Yeah, I, I would just, just add very briefly that I think the, the Kirigma doesn't change. Yeah. Um, m my emphasis tends to be on the, the Kirigma of the resurrection. So the problem of death and the need for resurrection remains timeless, mm -hmm. right? But the ways in which we work toward reducing death, both physical and spiritual, um, I think will change with historical, cultural realities. So um, in that sense, tradition is, is not, uh, is the, is the um, working out of the of the kirigma in those particularities, you know, whether it's a spiritual father with his spiritual child, or whether it's you know a church, a local church dealing with the questions of war. Um, I think those are those are both new and timeless. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, my question is. Harry, thank you for your, your talk. It was thank you. Very, very well done. Um, I have a bit of a dilemma. As a parent, okay, uh, in the family home, we are peacekeepers with the siblings in the family. Okay? And the common line in my family is if you don't love your sister, how are you going to love your enemy? And that whole dichotomy comes out, and they answer back in very interesting ways. But there's an issue here, and if I don't deal with it, I'm going to get. So I'm looking at that whole Sermon on the Mount of the Peacekeeper, and then I'm looking at Jesus from the other side, and the Jesus who's in the temple, and who's throwing over the money chambers, and whipping people, and yelling, you know, a very violent image, right, because he's justifying something that was wrong, and he wants to correct it by making an impact, and making an impression. So we have that violent Jesus as well as an image. How do you reconcile the two as a peacekeeper? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I, I don't know that I would use the same language, violent Jesus, because uh, even in the context of the temple, he wasn't acting violently in the sense of doing harm, physical harm to people, right? Uh, I think that's an important difference. Um, uh, it's one thing to be to express righteous anger or um, to uh, to articulate a kind of prophetic critique of what's going on, of how a community or a person has strayed from the covenant or has strayed from a right relationship with God, um, and I think that's that's maybe a better way to. Think about it in terms of, as a parent, we are um, trying to do both. We're trying to acknowledge, on the one hand, the the standards of good behavior, um, while um, at the same time, a, a proper behavior, of normative action, right, of normative uh, activity in the world, um, and at the same time, trying to teach mercy and forgiveness, um, which doesn't eliminate or, um, yeah, which doesn't eliminate or erase the fact that a transgression has been, has occurred, right? So I think that, that there's, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a biblical scholar to 
go into the details of you know exactly what's going on, and, and, and there's a long tradition of interpreting the Sermon on the Mount, and you know um, what exactly is meant by you know, turning the other cheek and being a peacekeeper, and Jesus's you know activity in the temple. That's that's a, a different angle on the question, but I think the, the, the broader ethical point is one of of um, holding together in this tension the call to be both to acknowledge the existence of moral norms and at the same time to uh, call to oneself and call others to um, be merciful and forgiving in the face of those norms. Is that helpful at all? Or? Um, <laughs> putting it on a global scale, yeah. let's say we are confronted with the new Hitler and we have to deal with this issue. How would a peacekeeper deal with someone who doesn't listen and who doesn't? With deep repentance, with a deep, with an acknowledgement of the fact that this is a tragic situation, in, the, in a way that's not altogether different from the tragedies that we face in our family lives when someone behaves badly, right? Yeah. Something has been done wrong, and it needs to be. No matter what, it's not going to be ideal. So. I mean, if we're dealing with someone who is committed to taking the lives of innocent people um, on a massive scale, um, that reality is an expression of the fall in the way that I was talking about Christian realism. And at the same time, it, it needs to be responded to with a kind of tragic acknowledgement of, of humanity's brokenness. And that tragedy means both that there's a tragedy in the perpetrator of the crime, and also a tragic element in our need to respond to it in a way that limits the damage. So that's, I think, where, as Orthodox, we're not absolute pacifists, um, I would argue, um, but we're also not going to take a moral high ground and say, you know, let's kill that SOB and, and feel really good about it, because um, it's never a good thing. Okay. Pardon, so you'd like yeah. to comment on this? May I add just a few words about this? Uh, it's, it's a very difficult question, but I think uh, it would pay attention. We realize that uh, what Jesus did uh, to these people, uh, you know, he pushed out of the temple. I think he's in line somewhere with uh, another quotation mark of violence. I mean, a kind of violence. I mean, the quotation mark again, violent discourse of Jesus against the Pharisees and all these religious people. But I think we have to see what happened in Pedra, a continuation of this violent, potential mark, discourse of Jesus and this violent uh, attitude towards these people exploitating the religious sentiment. I think uh, this is not in contradiction to what he said in the sermon on the mountain. Because in this sermon again, again, uh, he fascinated the, uh, this kind of hypocrisy and religious uh, exploitation of religious sentiment. So, of course, it's a difficult question, but I think we have to see uh, more a kind of continuation between them, and not a kind of contradiction. But of course, this remains open to discussion. I also think, too, very quickly, that um, I often think that, just in, that justice and love aren't opposed to each other. I think that I, I don't think you can really have love without justice. I was thinking parenting, going back to the parenting thought, you do try to keep peace with, with children, but there is a time that you need to, uh, on the behind, just to end it. You know? And I think even with, with God in the Old Testament, there was that little smack there. <laughs> um, Can I pass on to, to Father Vasily, yes, please? <laughs> Father Vasily, please. Uh, thank you. I'll stand up so I can. Better be seen. I'm sorry. I'd like to thank you for your illuminating talk. Um, uh, I come from the uh, uh, war broken Bosnia and Herzegovina, already mentioned here. Uh, and uh, thank God now there are certain acknowledgments of, of uh, interfaith dialogues and so forth, especially in the youth organizations. And uh, that is a great step for the future of this country. Um, now, I do have. Uh, question regarding war itself for a period. Um, is uh, war in the context of defense acceptable 
in the Orthodox perspective. And I'm asking this because of, uh, I do remember, I believe it was Constantine the philosopher in his dialogue with the Saracenes, uh, where he once spoke that this is, this kind of an aspect of war is acceptable because uh, those who are protecting their villages, countries, and so forth, are laying their heads for the loved ones. So would this be acceptable? In the right, and, and I think uh, it's, it's a really good question. It's, it's a complicated question. Um, I'll make a, a shameless plug here too. We have a book coming out later this year that's called Orthodox Perspectives on War that includes um, an essay that Telly has written, one that I've written, and about 10 or so other folks that have contributed. So you should look for that in the next few months. Um, and, uh, but the answer that I would give, um, Father Vasily Basil, is it? Yes. That is that um, I, I think the, the best response is to say or, the Orthodox Church has, uh, has not taken an absolute pacifist stance. Um, and therefore has practiced defensive war, but it becomes a question of just w when you start to talk about, you know, are defensive wars okay? Are they morally justifiable? Are they good? Are they even virtuous in some sense? And, and the answer that I would give to that is I think they're always viewed as tragic. Mm -hmm. And we see this, for example, in the canons of St. Basil, in one of Basil's canons where he says, Essentially, that um, a soldier who has taken the life of another, even if fighting in a justified war or fighting in a defensive war, uh, ought to abstain from communion for a period of time because his hands are not clean. And that's not intended to be a condemnation of his participation in war so much as it is an acknowledgement of the fact that any violence committed against another human person, no matter how necessary it was, no matter how, whether, whether how justifiable it is in terms of the situation, is the loss of human life, and that is tragic. So I guess I would say, yes, the Orthodox Church has, has allowed for defensive war, but it ought to do so without any sort of triumphalism, without any sort of celebration, without any anything other than a deep sense of tragedy that they face, that this is necessary. Does that help that? Yeah. Great answer. So I would ask here, what about in the Orthodox defensive wars? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a very difficult question. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Father Jeffrey? I was just going to ask, uh, would you draw a line or some distinction between uh, questions of values in a pluralistic society, or any of the speakers really, and ones that touch on uh, life or death. We've spoken about war, but I'm thinking also of issues like abortion or euthanasia, which are continuing to be big issues in our society, issues on which you know, certain Christians have taken a very strident uh, position. Others have accepted the fact that there's a plural view in society. But do we, do we draw a distinction between lifestyle sort of choices and things which in our society do end up in a death of some kind, whether it's at end of life or at the beginning of life? Do, is there an area in which we are more called to action in the political sphere in defense of our own values right. than in other areas? So, Again, a very yeah. uh, hot current issue in yeah. Canadian politics, and I'm sure in American politics as well, uh, very much so. Who would like to, to jump in? <laughs> <laughs> We're sort of passing the buck here. Uh, you're at the end of the table, so. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough call. I mean, I think um, you know, I think um, it, it really has to be. Um, it, there has to be a sense of, 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 of handling these things sort of issue by issue, right? I mean, there's several layers of discussion here. One, uh, one is. One is the issue of um, to what extent really are um, uh, people allowed to enter into public debates uh, using their own uh, specific uh, beliefs and commitments. And there are some who would say, no, no, you have to bracket your commitments in order to enter the public debate. I mean, which in many ways is unrealistic, because uh, even if you say to yourself, I'm a Christian, 
and because I believe, you know, in the super way of understanding Christianity, I should bracket these beliefs as enter the debate. You're earlier really drawing on your beliefs anyway to enter the that the idea that somehow you can bracket your beliefs while you're politically participating, I think, is sometimes like that. And I think more and more in political philosophy, I think that's being recognized to some extent. Another layer here is, okay, well, even if that's the case, then, um, you know, in some sense, what, what principles govern sort of the ultimate sort of uh, legislative process, right? And you see this quite clearly in America to some extent. It's very interesting. I mean, um, to take a, somewhat of a non, somewhat of a non-controversial issue in orthodoxy, when uh, evangelicals um, who are an, most of them are anti-evolution, not all of them, but most of them are anti-evolution, when they're sort of maneuvering somehow to add creationism in the public schools, not so much to eliminate. They, uh, it's very quite interesting what they do. They, they don't say, well, the Bible says so. They says, which that's also quite disputable, but they, um, the, what they do is they say, well, you know, this is one theory, and in order to uh, enhance critical thinking, we have to add up more theories, right? So it's quite fascinating. They, they, they're clearly motivated by certain religious beliefs, but they draw on what they see as the acceptable language and processes in order to get their point. You see this very clearly in the abortion debate, and you also saw it very clearly in the gay marriage debate. And that's why I think gay marriage is like accelerating in the United States in terms of being legalized, because no one's really convinced in the public sphere that you know, somehow traditional values, the family, other things are under threat if we do this. No one's, more and more people are not convinced by that. But it's very interesting that the abortion debate's been going on for at least 40 years or so in America, and that is still about 50-50, right? And actually, with scientific enhancement, a lot, you know, it, it's kind of tipping a scale slightly. I don't know if you have a comment on this, but it's tipping a scale slightly. So that's actually very fascinating. But even in the abortion debate, when Christians enter that debate, they, they start leaving image of God language behind, and they start talking about what constitutes a person. We don't even realize that we're doing that sometimes in the debate. So in some sense, we're, 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 we're fighting against something, but then we're accepting its terms, and trying to accept it, trying to, uh, based on those terms, use it against it, and so on and so forth, right? So, um, so that's one layer. Now the third layer then is, I think, once we, we, once we accept that th those are the terms of discussion, uh, for me as a Christian church, I'm okay with that being the terms of the discussion, right? I'm okay with that. And at that point, then, I, I don't think you should draw back. I think that there should be people speaking according to their religious convictions and giving a sense of what personhood means and so on and so forth. And then, to some extent, seeing... You know, how can that be somewhat legitimated within the already existing, uh, accepted sort of principles and values? And then just seeing if it's, if it's persuasive or not, right? Right? But at the same time, and I'll end here, I mean, I also think Christians have to really discern, and this is where it gets a little bit harder. Christians have to really discern, like, okay, within our ecclesial space, this is what we do, and this is what we don't allow, and this is a, some of the things. These are some of the distinctions we make, and so on and so forth. But this is really not something that we should try to impose on the public political space, and that's okay. In other words, that's what it means to be Christian, right? That's what it means to be Christian: is that we understand the disconnect, but you know, perhaps you know, this kind of pluralism, this kind of you know, it's really not uh, threatening to what we're trying to achieve in the public the political space. Murder obviously is, uh, to go to another extreme example, right? But are there really other kinds of things happening in ways that, that perhaps within our ecclesial space, we, you know, we're still, you know, there's, it seems to be a, a certain kind of new opinion, somewhat debatable, somewhat not. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Yeah. It has to be very clear about, the church has to be very clear about what it wants to achieve, what it thinks it should be, what things should be achieved within the public political space, but, but, but one that really is directed, it sees as being directed towards God as a public political space, you see? Otherwise there's an elision 
And that elision is happening in places like, in my opinion, places like Russia, which is an incredibly contradictory space. Because in one sense they're they're coming out very they're obviously coming out very strongly against some issues, and another issue they're just like uh, Russia has one of the highest rates of abortion in Europe. One of the highest rates of abortion in Europe. Greece as well. And Greece. And this is where the church is manifestly hypocritical. Yeah, I, can I just add a very quick comment? Um, I, I would say that, you know, um, I do think there's a difference. Um, I think matters of, of biological life are, are um, do carry a weight, a moral weight that, you know, isn't the same as all other issues. But I guess my, my caution would be to try to somehow quantify these things or come up with a calculus that, you know, we can plug our situation into as an Orthodox Christian and say, okay, well, here's the result, you know, and this, this is what I should prioritize. Because, you know, again, I, I think the, the, the two examples that you raise of, you know, the beginning of life and abortion and end of life and euthanasia, um, you know, may end up being a very different kinds of positions, you know. Um, uh, I think as, as, as Orthodox with respect to the abortion question, you know, we are pro-life, and, and, but we can't just be pro-life in the way that most, many conservative citizens are. We have to be pro-life in terms of offering a real pastoral response to pregnant mothers, or, you know, pregnant uh, women who feel trapped and um, don't, have, don't have a clear option other than, you know, don't feel like the church is a place that they can go to for help, right? Read Al, uh, Pandeli mentioned uh, Al Rabito. He, he writes really beautifully on that question of, you know, just how, yes, as an Orthodox church, we need to be pro life, but we can't just be, you know, condemnatory pro life. We have to provide a real alternative. People, you know, relationships break down, things happen, you know, and we need to be able to provide a real pastoral response in those situations. And, uh, yeah. I was going to say, it's less the specific issues than the, the sort of nature of the issues themselves. Yeah. If you were in Nazi Germany, you wouldn't say, as Christians, we disagree with sending people to the gas chambers, <laughs> but it's a plural society. No. Yes. You know, within Absolutely. our church, we yes. don't do that. However, the majority yeah. of the population Absolutely. is doing this. Yeah. Therefore, you know, we would have even probably entered into defensive wars on behalf of the people who are suffering, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. I suppose it's, it's the nature yeah. of, of, of the issue. Is there I a sense agree. in which there are certain things that we say, yes, freedom, human freedom exists. People can live that way and be accepted outside the church, but actually, as a society, life and death, you know, yeah. whatever those issues are, is there a way in which we say there's a line there? Yeah, no, and I, I think we do, but, but just, okay, sorry. We're running out of time here, and I see uh, Professor Schneider has uh, his hand up. I'm sure he will yes, have a challenging point to make. I, I do want to thank you all. This was an absolutely fabulous uh, afternoon. So really grateful. I will also like Paul remind the audience that we do have a <coughs> kind of moral obligation to see if the gentlemen get lunch and make it back to their afternoon, <laughs> back to their afternoon session. They're here for a major conference. Um, and also a reminder that if we're going to deal with this just war thing, which we did, you know, for peacemaking, which we did in the Canadian Council of Churches, one of the things the Orthodox are going to have to do is re-examine their hymnography, which is very Byzantine. Yeah. Um, and the question builds on Kelly's last intervention. I wonder if we could make a theological principle out of what he said. Um, in the sense, and what I want to make the focus is the peculiar North American situation. Uh, North America in church history is a unique situation because it's, it was founded on a principle of separation of church and state. First such example in history, actually. Um, and this puts the church in a remarkable position because, um, on the one hand, um, it's free of the possibility of persecution, maybe not on a practical level, but at least in, in principle. Um, <clears throat> but on the other hand, it has no, um, pow no power, has no inherent control over the government. And the government is founded on a different principle, which is rights. This was inherent in all the papers. Right? Now, rights is a very peculiar idea. Um, 
the way, the principle of rights as grounded in the Constitution of the United States is natural law. Uh, the practice of rights, how do you determine what these rights are, is grounded, in fact, in equity law. Um, to get to know what your rights are, you have to go to court. And it makes the Supreme Court, in fact, the highest determiner of the virtues in the land. Um, where does this leave the church? And it strikes me um, that the thrust that we've heard today, and I think it's absolutely right, is that the church has to, where the church has to stand is to go back to its original <coughs> mandate, which is to, work, to witness, to be a martyr. Um, that, that's what Jacobus was doing, right? That's what George Ignatieff was doing in Canada when he, an Orthodox Christian, when he invented the idea of peacekeeping. Um, it, in other words, we don't enter the political sphere as politicians. We, I would, we enter yeah. as um, apostles. I would agree with that. I mean, I think, you know, that's one of the issues. And so, but look, first of all, to, to become a martyr, I mean, I, it, it, I don't want to be too hard on people who aren't willing to become martyrs because if you become a martyr, I mean, it takes a lot of spiritual strength to do that. But in some sense, I think that is correct. In other words, that... You know, we have to kind of speak to our vision, but in a way that we have to be ready for people just to slap us in the face and just reject it, right? And I think that, um, you know, I think that Christians become, we see this in America, evangelical Christians, especially within the United States, especially because they see things turning. You know, they, they, they want to resort towards institutionalized force of some sort, sense. And I think that temptation is obviously going on in Russia right now. And I think that... Um, yeah, I mean, I think you're right in the sense that we're not willing to just be martyrs in some sense. That you know, to, to speak to the vision, but be ready for people just to reject us. Um, and, uh, and and just one last point, just to be clear, I, I want to make it clear that what I'm proposing would definitely not be something that would accept Nazi Germany's. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I only want to be clear that what I'm what I'm proposing is that you know, we're, if Christians were to really engage in the practices of uh, you know, that they want, they should engage in, but the political shape that they would would shape, the, the political space that they would shape would be something more like liberal democracy. But when they do that, liberal democracy uh, is never sort of just neutral. I mean, there are certain basic principles which guide it and structure it, and upon which certain things are uh, legislatively approved. So th those are the principles I'm talking about, right? When it comes to Nazi Germany, then all you have is resistance and prophecy. Right, right. Because as a Christian, you can't just look at the mass murder of of others and kind of say, "Oh well, you know, that's the public space," and I can't even agree with it. No, no, that's you know, that's not that that I would never accept anything like that. No, in fact, I think well, what I'm trying to make uh, what I'm trying to argue is that Christians not simply can uneasily accept a, a liberal a, a kind of liberal democracy, but that that's actually to see it as uh, exactly uh, um, what you know, what, what Christians would want in a political space, while they continue to participate and negotiate the various things in it. Perry, would you like to have a last? <coughs> um, I, I think on this on this question of, of um, martyrdom and and uh, and, prof and and prophetic witness, um, I I would I think that there's I think that the Orthodox position is not altogether different from from Bonhoeffer's example, um, and insofar as Bonhoeffer, you know, was part of the of the plot to assassinate Hitler, and at the same time didn't seek to justify his actions theologically, mm -hmm. didn't seek to didn't say my hands are clean because what I'm doing is the right thing. He basically said, I'm doing this because I feel compelled to do it, and I throw myself at the mercy of God to judge whether or not I should have done something different, right? So I think that there's a, that, that, is, that is a really, really, I think a, a very appropriate image of the tragic quality of so many of these ethical dilemmas that we face. The complexity and the tragic quality, and there's, but there's a kind of freedom in realizing that we're not bound to these abstract laws. We are bound by the catechism. Patrick, the final... Yeah, final word. Uh, this is a very interesting but uh, non-finishing discussion, actually, and 
you put uh, in fact many many examples as the last one mentioned by by Perry, for example, we put out similar examples in the uh, Greek or in the white Orthodox tradition, for example, of hierarchs or priests taking arms in order to defend uh, you know uh, the nation, uh, the homeland, etc. etc. But I would say uh, if you allow me uh, just a final remark. Uh, same-sex marriage or abortion are, of course, very, very important issues. But uh, in my understanding and in my view, uh, this is a particular uh, American or North American way to enter to the discussion of the uh, political theory of issues. I mean, uh, there is a particularity or there is a difference between the American and the European context. I mean, in the American or North American context, uh, I think the most important issues are somewhat related to what you could call uh, sexual morality or moral issues or values. Uh, instead, I think political theology, at least at the beginning in the, in the European context, was related to the uh, social justice uh, and economic uh, equality mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm in the sense that uh, social justice and social justice and exploitation is something which affects the uh, image of God in human persons. So uh, political theology at the beginning was and still is uh, an attempt to make justice for human person uh, following Christ uh, saying that in every human person we could recognize the person of God. <coughs> so just a final remark about this. Of course, this is not uh, a remark to close the debate, but to continue the debate. And so thank you for your presence here. Uh, well, Dr. Uh, Papa Nicolau referred to a conference uh, being uh, hosted by uh, Fordham University at the end of June on tradition, fundamentalism, and secularism. I'm sure many of these same issues yeah. uh, will come up uh, in depth at, at that uh, at I have that, some that informational cards for our Orthodox Center here. If, uh, the nice icon. If anybody would like some, I only have ten. I'm sorry, but maybe oh, you can, maybe you, oh, maybe you can share one. <laughs> yeah, maybe you can share. Please do, please do check out our website for this um, for this um, conference, uh, and I hope some of you will join us. It will be, I think, a very fruitful discussion. May I say that there are some of those academic programs of last year that they did that and said or said. There you have something. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my final act will be uh, to uh, thank our three uh, speakers. Uh, we have, uh, in fact, uh, hijacked them uh, from, uh, from, uh, from other meeting. Uh, so they have taken uh, time out. We've taken very much advantage of uh, their presence uh, here in Toronto uh, to put on uh, this, uh, this event. And we're uh, certainly very grateful uh, to them. It's a very unique opportunity. Yeah, and we're copying this channel uh, with additional people at, uh, <laughs> at the Royal York. Uh, what do you call it? The Fairmont Royal the York. Fairmont. What's the room? The um, Territories room. Right, it's at 4 to 5.30, so you're, you're free to join us there if some of you would like to come over and, uh, and join us. Uh, Stanley Harawas is a very famous uh, Protestant theologian. He was named by Time Magazine in America as a I don't know, theologian of the century or something. He'll be responding to the three of us and one other person. So if some of you are free, you're more than welcome to join us there. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you again. And, uh, thank you for taking me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.